So Ellie from Resilient Lismore, um, I, I, I went down to help with the flood eff effort in Lismore and I was just really impressed by the amazing setup that they've got in Lismore and thinking how can we, how can we um, bring some of, what can we do in Armadale? That, that, that's a, it's a really wonderful example of preparedness and moving forward and exhaustion and not enough volunteers to do and expertise to do what you're trying to do, but like, it's great. So welcome Ellie and um, we're pleased to hear from you about how things are right. <clears throat> uh, Thanks for having me. Can you all hear me well enough? Yes, thanks Ellie. Um, thanks. Thanks for your patience. Um, I do have to admit that I um, I did forget <laughs> I was supposed to be coming on, um, but that's because we're in recovery. Um, and I will also be very frank and say that I haven't prepared anything to speak to you this evening, um, but uh, disaster recovery has been something that has shaped my life for the last five years. So I think I can have a conversation with you about uh, what it's like for us here in Lismore, what we're going through, what we're doing as a community, how we're working together to respond. So before I kick off, I'll just acknowledge that I'm joining you this evening on Widjibal Weibel land in the Bundjalung Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Here in Lismore, we have incredible First Nations leadership being shown on the ground with the grassroots community response being led by the Koori Mail. The Koori Mail are a Indigenous-led newspaper that have also become a disaster recovery um, community network that are mobilising to distribute goods, coordinate volunteers and uh, lead the recovery. So uh, I guess you all know what's happened to us here in Lismore, but I also suggest that unless you've been to visit us, you probably don't really have an understanding of what's happened to us. So I was talking today with a fellow from the Salvos who was comparing what's happened in this most recent flood event to what happened during the bushfires. Um, during the bushfires, and, and don't quote me on my statistics and my numbers because I don't always retain them very well, but in the bushfires there was perhaps something like 5,000 homes impacted across New South Wales. In Lismore we've had 5,000 homes impacted within our city. So that's just here in Lismore. We are the epicenter of a region-wide disaster, um, the scale of which I never thought that I would see. And I mobilised in 2017 after the flood that we had then, which was an 11.7 metre flood. We thought at that time that that was going to be the biggest flood we would ever see uh, in a very long time. And then here we are, Five years later, we've had um, a flood larger than any in living memory, definitely larger than any since colonisation. And you would have seen the devastating images of what's happened to the heart of my beautiful community. We've had water inundated up to the roofs of thousands and thousands and thousands of homes. Uh, we don't have a handle on what the displacement looks like. We don't have a handle on how many people have been displaced from their homes because it's incredibly difficult to track. The latest estimates are somewhere between 10 and 14,000 people um, just out of Lismore, and that doesn't track the broader Northern Rivers. Obviously, there have been significant impacts across other communities like Korokai, Woodburn, Ballina had flooding in places it's never had flooding. Byron Bay had flooding just the other day. But um, again, the epicentre of this disaster is right here in my community in Lismore. And I also acknowledge that we've got really significant um, landscape collapse. It's being referred to by somebody that I know out in the hills. So we have landslides and um, roads that have just crumbled away and aren't there anymore. So... The scale of what we are living through is um, unimaginable, even for those who have, um, have been in it. 
before. And then last week we had the fourth highest flood on record come through our city. And that's been a really strange experience because that flood, which um, only got to 11.4 metres, um, was so much smaller than the previous flood on the 28th of February that um, it's almost like it didn't happen. And that's a really strange thing to wrap your head around. So that's the context. That's what we're living through. Uh, our entire CBD is destroyed. Lismore is the heart of the region of the Northern Rivers. It's where all of our professional services are, our banks, our lawyers, our accountants, our social services, our community housing providers, our disability support services, um, everything that is provided to the broader community of the Northern Rivers is situated in the flood basin terrible town planning, but that's the situation that we're in. So as a community, we have residences that have been wiped out, but we've also had all of our services wiped out as well. Um, so now that I've painted the picture, I'll speak to you about Resilient Lismore. So we are a community initiative that started in 2017. In 2017, we were known as Lismore Helping Hands and we came together in the first few days after the flood. Uh, we were a large Facebook group network. Um, at that time, we were amazed that our Facebook group had grown to 3,000 people um, in a space of five days. That Facebook group has subsequently gone on and now it has 30,000 people in it. It's the same Facebook group that has um, gone on an evolution since the 2017 event. Now we are managing a group of around 30,000 people, um, which has its own challenges. As well as doing that, and within that Facebook group um, and social media has its challenges, but it's also very powerful because we know that it's how community members um, talk to each other and, and self-organise and connect with each other. So we're really... Um, supportive of that peer-to-peer -peer connectivity and community supporting community. So that's very important to us. But we're also managing a database where we match volunteers with jobs that are required. So the messaging that we put out to our community is always um, help your family, your friends, your businesses, or your community networks that you know and that you have relationships with, help them first. And then if you have um, extra capacity or you can help other people, then come to us and we'll find you other work. Um, similarly, from an impacted residence perspective, we are saying, you know, if you can get help from your friends, your family or your networks, that's the priority. Get help from people that you know. And if you get into a position where um, you need more help than you're able to rally from the people around you, then come to us and we'll help to connect you to bigger support networks. Um, one of the really interesting things about this particular disaster recovery is the partnerships that we've got going with the formal agencies and the formal response. We know that as disasters continue to escalate, um, we're going to see disaster upon disaster. They always seem to be getting bigger, bigger and bigger disasters that we're living through in Australia. We know that Australia is on the forefront of climate change. We are going to live through big disasters in our lifetime. And we know that the community must partner with government. The community and government must partner with community. Um, these events are far too big just for government to manage, and they're definitely far too big for community to manage. So we must work side by side. And Resilient Lismore has got that going really well. We work with the Army, the Australian Defence Force, who are here in numbers. Uh, we work with the Formal Recovery Agency and we are collaborating in terms of getting some of those bigger jobs managed. Um, I want to pick up on what I heard Helen say before, which is around uh, community preparedness for events like this. Um, I have a history in community development and I know that it's the fabric of a community that serves a community well when events like this hit. So 
It's about the relationships that you have with each other within your community. It's about the networks that you have and how those networks intersect with each other. It's about how people you know and you trust in your community and um, who you can pick up the phone to when disaster strikes to get things organised. So I always say when I'm talking to my community and to any other community that the best possible thing you can do about around preparedness and resilience is to do work together, do things together, do events, um, whatever they may be. They don't have to be disaster specific. It can be any sort of gathering or event, but do things that build relationships in your community. Get to know people in your community so that when um, a situation out of the ordinary does hit, you know each other and you can work together to solve, solve problems. Um, I guess a final thing just while I'm we're speaking off the cuff. The other thing that I think that we should be heartened by um, as, as communities that get to live in these extraordinary times is that we are inherently um, creative, innovative and skilled. And so it's really important that when um, situations like this hit that we are um, able and supportive of being flexible and being adaptive and being able to respond to emergent um, offers and situations. So for instance, the database that we are running um, was an idea that someone just walked into the room where we were responding and said, hey, I've got this database, why don't we try using it? And, and in any disaster like this that happens suddenly, um, People will always pop up with systems and processes and ways of working in order to respond as a community. So I think it's really important that we embrace that complexity, we embrace that emergent technology, we embrace the solutions that will be coming to the fore and that we um, step out boldly and bravely into the world of uncertainty as we work together to respond. That's probably all I've got off the cuff. Um, I'm really happy to take questions or to ask anything, or if you've got prompt questions you'd like to offer me, I'm happy to respond. I've got, I've got a couple of questions, Ellie. Um, right. One is, um, yeah, funding. Funding. What kind of funding do you need and how do you access that? And is there enough? And how, you know, do you need more? How, how could more be made available? Sure. Um, so one of the learnings that we had from 2017 was that um, we didn't put enough focus into capturing the offers that were made into our community. So in 2017, we were so busy responding and um, catching truckloads of furniture and white goods and things like that, that we missed a lot of the opportunity that comes in that initial um, outpouring of love and support. So um, one of the things that's really important to remember is that, I mean, I think Lismore stayed in the news cycle for a little bit longer, but you really only have about seven days of media attention to put your message out into the community, the, the wider community, and to make your ask. So we were ready this time um, to respond and we um, established um, a partnership with a local philanthropic organisation. So we were able to accept deductible gift um, donations pretty much immediately. So Resilient Lismore has raised enough money to transition us from a purely volunteer led effort. So to date and um, what we're coming up to uh, approaching six weeks. So from impact until now, it's been entirely volunteer run, but there is only so long that volunteer initiatives can go for. So we've, we've got enough money for seed funding. The next phase is to start being really on the front foot with government and with funding agencies to uh, affirm and um, really strongly advocate for funding for community-led initiatives. 
the best recovery is community-led recovery. So I am of the firm opinion that the role of government is to go into communities, find the organisations and the community networks that are doing the work already and resource those organisations and networks to keep supporting their own communities. The worst possible thing that can happen after a disaster is for a whole lot of um, and no offence to anyone from Sydney in the audience, but the worst possible thing is for a whole lot of people from Sydney to be flown into the disaster who don't know the community, who don't have the networks and who don't have the relationships that are necessary to um, enhance a strong recovery. So, yeah, so we've got seed funding that we've managed to gather from fundraising. And so now we're moving into an advocacy position to um, really affirm the role of community in recovery. And I'll be doing everything I possibly can to get as much funding as we can because recovery is a long road. And um, yeah, we need government funding to be able to do it. It's not fair and it's not appropriate that community initiatives should be funded from within impacted communities. And the other question I had was insurance because, uh, like, you know, you were in a tricky situation there of having a whole lot of volunteers who you don't necessarily know coming in. Um, yeah. How did you manage that issue? Yeah. Um, so in disasters, they're known as spontaneous volunteers. So they're the amazing, incredible, well-meaning people that just pour into a disaster zone and get stuck in and do it. Um, so you're never going to be able to properly manage that. But we moved quite quickly and you would think that it would be challenging to get insurance or volunteer insurance in a um, situation like this, but it's not. Um, it's actually um, very achievable. And as long as you have some fairly um, straightforward volunteer management processes in place, um, that you're supplying and emphasising safety uh, equipment and supply and use. And so one of the things we did pretty much from day one was we um, called out for really significant donations and supplies of personal protective equipment. And we've been putting that onto volunteers as fast as we possibly can. Um, we also have a sign up process and, you know, the volunteer has to sign that they um, know and accept the risk that they are entering into. And um, yeah, we meet the requirements of volunteer management and we're able to secure insurance for our volunteers. And, and have you got like, how are you seeing that? panning into the future in terms of your need for the numbers of volunteers? Have you got adequate? Is there a big shortage in some areas? Um, yeah. Definitely. So in our, uh, in our volunteer system at any one time, we still have work that we could, um, and this is only like a snapshot of a day, we could probably task at least 2,000 volunteers right now just based on the work that we have currently in our system. And, and that's just at a point in time, as we know, um, the jobs are long and they have long lifespans. And so, you know, we, we could easily task um, thousands of volunteers every day. Uh, so yeah, the unfortunate, well, the reality of spontaneous volunteers is they do come in a surge uh, so in the initial, straight after impact, you have this big spike of volunteers and then the next weekend, because they do come on the weekends when they can from work, the next weekend you'll have a slightly higher spike and then they'll taper off and you'll just be in that everyday space of volunteering. Um, one of the great things we've got going at the moment is we've got some partnerships with local businesses. Um, so for instance, Norco, I'm sure you're all familiar with Norco Milk. Unfortunately, Norco has been um, badly impacted as well in this event, but what they are doing is um, while they have some recovery funding, they're um, continuing to pay their staff and their staff are coming and working with us um, in the recovery. We've also got some good partnerships with people like Volunteering Gold Coast who are sending down busloads of volunteers to us on regular bases. And we have 
um, the occasional good-hearted soul who has ridden their motorbike from Perth and they'll come and work with us for three weeks and things like that. So one of the challenges in Lismore is accommodation. We don't have a lot of space for people to stay um, because so much of our housing stock has been wiped out, but um, we're doing the best that we can and working to try and find solutions every day. And as we do, we'll continue to access um, particularly corporate um, volunteers I think is the best pathway but um, by all means if any of you would like to send a bus um, up to Lismore we will welcome you with warm arms and put you straight to work. And and where could we where could people stay like we camped on the showground um, you know what what options are there for people if they do come down? Yeah so un unfortunately the second flood put us back a little bit um, but before the second flood, we had almost um, got the Lismore Turf Club online for volunteer accommodation and camping. Um, we're working really hard to try and find billets because um, as much as many impacted people are staying in spare rooms and whatever accommodation is available in the wider community, a lot of that is short term and short term doesn't necessarily work for flood affected people. So yeah, we're working to build our billeting list and um, there's a couple of second story hotels that are still kind of doable, but the, but the thing to do is to reach out to us, let us know that you'd like to come and then we'll work to find solutions. Uh, Margaret's question. Margaret? I just want to Margaret? get, I'll, I'll tell. I'll tell. <laughs> Would you mind walking here because she won't hear you. Yeah, it's all right, I can translate something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I just... Thanks so much. It's really great to hear you. Um, I just wanted to ask about a lot of that sort of uh, flood victim short-term accommodation might be coping with sort of couch surfing, whatever, but mm. what is in place or what do you need for long-term accommodation yep. or medium-term for, yep. for actual flood victims? Yeah. Um, so one thing, and this is not a criticism, but I really like to try and change up the language when we're talking about what's happened to our community. So I like to use the phrase flood survivors or affected people. Um, I think that as we think about disasters and what happens to us, we need to try and um, change our terminology, change our terminology from victims. Um, that's just my own little flag. I'm going to wave there. Um, and yeah, housing is... There's, there's no solution and it is an absolute pain point. Um, in one of the first meetings that I sat in on, um, only a few days after this event, someone mentioned Christchurch and the similarities of what happened, what has happened to us here in Lismore um, as what happened in Christchurch. And in Christchurch, um, same thing, people went and camped in on top of each other, stayed with the generosity of strangers and then you know, it doesn't take long for that to become an additional pain point, an additional pressure point. And um, we're just waiting for the state government to find solutions. And I'm not afraid to say that they are moving too slowly. Um, there are no solutions. And what we have seen in the last few days is that people who've been put into temporary accommodation are now having to relocate and move because obviously it's Easter and we live in the Northern Rivers and the tourists are coming. So um, flood affected people are being shuffled out of the accommodation that they are in to make way for um, visitors to our region. Um, there are no solutions, which is why at Resilient Lismore, what we are trying to focus on is a short term goal of making as much of the flood affected housing safe, secure and warm in time for winter. So even if all we can do is get one room in a house to a point where we can have a bed in there, the windows closed, the doors lock, um, they are warm enough and they have, you know, functioning bathroom, it's not very dignified, but that is the housing that exists in our community at the moment. And um, we need something and the state government is moving far too slowly for the thousands of displaced people. Any other questions? That was, oh, sorry, Carla. Sorry, I have to unmute myself. Here we go. Yeah, um, I just remembered as I'm listening to you, 
that I visited a company in Lismore or close to Lismore that are actually doing container housing. Yes. And I'm thinking in terms of long-term preparedness, I mean, container housing would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Because they yeah. are made for like shipping yes. situations where, you know, any additional rainfalls wouldn't even be a problem there. So I wonder, have you thought about that? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, so one of the things that our local MP is pushing very hard for, and I, um, I'm with her on it, is that she's calling for a reconstruction commission for Lismore. And when people ask me, and you know, the big question is, what are you going to do? Are you going to move Lismore off the floodplain? And my answer is, we need innovative and um, quick response thinking to support people to make decisions that they want to make. So in the first place, if people want to get off the floodplain, we should enable them to do so. We should be providing um, a land swap, house swap initiative for people who do not want to live through that again. And that is an incredibly valid um, position. But for people that are robust and willing to live on the floodplain because we do love our river um, when our river is um, being its everyday self, we need to have um, solutions and innovative building codes that people can embrace and move through. So again, um, it's just too slow. We have people now who have um, ripped out the insides of their houses and they have no surety about um, what's coming next. So people are in this limbo of not being able to make decisions because um, it's too slow. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in Darwin shortly after Cyclone Tracy. Everyone has been telling me that in Tracy, there was a reconstruction commission established three days after the event and they just got on with it and did it and built a cyclone-proof city. Um, we are six weeks out from our event and still there are just big meetings that don't seem to go anywhere and no housing on the ground. So yeah. it's, it's very frustrating. So yes, I absolutely agree with you. There are solutions, um, but like everything, we need government to enable those solutions yeah. and um, support the community. And it goes back to exactly what I was saying at the beginning. We need community um, and government to partner and to work hand in hand and alongside each other. But um, perhaps I'm an idealist there because um, structural and systemic um, problems with government are not always um, responsive to that sort of thing. So Thanks. I think we'll, we'll finish there, Ellie. Thank you no so much. That was really helpful. Really we're all really, really, um, you spoke very clearly and to, from the heart and uh, it's really great to get that connection to Lismore community. Thank you for all the effort that you're putting in there no and worries. Um, hopefully we, we can um, just continue yeah. to help. Yeah. Come visit, we'll welcome you <laughs> and um, have a great evening and good on you for thinking about sustainability, good on you for thinking about preparedness. It's critically important.